One of the things that we've really seen uh, um, to build the success is events like this where you can bring uh, both uh, workplace partners, <coughs> employers and unions uh, to, the, to, the, to the table. Uh, organizations like Skills for Change that, that uh, have a really good connection with the community and, uh, and then government agencies of course. When you do a presentation to a group and you mention skill trades, the initial thing that comes to mind is then is construction. And then you try to educate them there's more than that to construction. Before you can construct anything you've got to manufacture. And then trying to educate in the sense that the, uh, the exposure that they, they have every single day to what they take for granted is technology. And the technology is not flipping the switch, it's what's inside what you're flipping the switch for. And education is the paramount uh, focus uh, to parents and to the youth or the people who want to change a career. That there are so many, many different areas that they can look at in the area of technology, um, uh, skill trades, and I hired a couple electricians that uh, were foreign trained but didn't have Canadian qualifications. Okay, so I've hired two. Uh, um, both of them uh, aggressively approached us, so they came to us. And I would encourage you, if you're dealing with, with uh, individuals that have, um, you know, have skills in, that are from you know, a foreign country or whatever, that are confident in their ability to work, um, they're gonna, they're gonna, they should go to smaller companies, okay? They should knock on doors, be aggressive, and, and say to the, ask to speak to the owner of the company and say, look, at, you know, I have these skills, I'm willing to start at a lower salary rate, but I would also like a training program where I can get to where I'm going. And what we did was we helped a couple of these guys get their 309As and now they're licensed electricians. So there, there is a positive side to it. Um, when they're approaching larger companies, larger companies are going to be, are not going to want to be involved with people that aren't or that are, are sort of um, don't fit into their role specifically. So I would encourage, um, you know, you people you're speaking to, to knock on doors, to be more aggressive. Don't wait for, for something to come to you. Go out and ask. Part of the problems with construction, as was mentioned already, it's so cyclical and, and it's tough to identify where the needs are, where they're going to be in eight years. and and where the capital investments are going to be when it comes to uh, building new buildings and, and renovating these places. So one of the, the goals for us is to, is to participate in those types of forecasting endeavors and to ensure that we know where the needs are going to be in Ontario and the different parts of Ontario as well as across Canada. So the CSC over the next eight years from a forecast from 2011 looking at 2012 to 2020 is showing that in Ontario there's going to be uh, at least 60,000 new construction uh, workers required in the province and that of course spans all the different trades that exist and if you divide that out by 12, uh, 12 years or 8 years um, you're looking at about five, anywhere from five to 10,000 uh, workers are needed per uh, year. My mandate here is to uh, provide stewardship for the skilled trades and vocational programs at Humber. We have about 23 programs of that nature that are running. Uh, Carrier Drive, the building you're in, is, is uh, a new venture for us, about three years old. We're pleased to partner with Skills for Change in their endeavors, which are well, the same path as ours. The people ask me, what's your job? It's really pretty easy. It, it's produce taxpayers. Help, help people realize their dreams, be somebody, buy a house, get a car, get some kids, send them to school, and all that. We've been doing this a really long time, as have I. Um, personally, I have five children, and professionally, I have three and a half thousand children. And I take it really seriously, because everybody's somebody's kid, everybody wants to be somebody. It's a real honor to be part of this, and, and part of this I call it a vocation. It's not a job, it's a way of um, A lot of people are not really aware that um, to be a machinist it actually four years. And then you need at least I mean, two, to, two to three years experience before you can actually call yourself a machinist. And so this is the uh, problem that's arising when companies look for people and say, I'm a machinist, but I'm really a machinist, a machine operator. Or they work to CNC. And so that's one of the problems why a lot of the machinists can't retire. A lot of them want to retire, but they can't retire. And the colleges are not producing, because they're always behind. 
and we're behind close to, I reckon, about 10 years. Getting people here isn't as tough as getting them the job once they're here. Yeah, there's opportunities, but how do you get a guy who knows a guy to get you the interview to the place where you could, and industry is really, really fickle. I heard you asking about this company that needed the perfect candidate right now. I never hear about industry really volunteering any of their time or effort for training programs or communication. What do we need? Not yesterday, because we're baking a cake, I need flour. What are we going to do next year and two years and three years from now? So this policy may have some bearing on the future of Canada and have a look forward. It's good. It's encouraging to see that the government is looking at the demographic of the labor market. Help us be proactive rather than react. And a question was posed to him. If you bring in all these skilled trades into the country, what about the youth that don't have employment that can be trained for this? There was no response. When the youth unemployment rate in, in, uh, in Canada is reaching close to 15%, and when you look at uh, youth unemployment in other areas of the world, especially Spain, where it's now 40%, What's happening to training these youth for the future? This is the problem. If you bring, and I'm not against it, I'm an immigrant myself, after I came back 40, 30 odd years ago. But what I've realized that if people come as an immigrant, as a trades worker, they're youth, they're children, they don't want them to be in the same thing because we bring certain cultures with us. That you work with your hands, you don't want your children to be the same thing. And it just permeates the same thing. So the student, the youth are gonna be in the same area. And so I'm against it, not because I don't want anybody to come in, but we need to restructure what we have here so already. A lot of these small contractors, they're unwilling to take on or make the commitment to indenturing in a new apprentice. So you gotta, you got to work with these, these players in the field to say, take on a new person. We can support you. We can provide resources and make sure that the person is up to speed with respect to uh, skills or health and safety. It is the small businesses out there that are that have the capacity to hire it's the larger contractors that have restrictive ratios of three to one so they need to hire three more journey persons to get that next apprentice and um, that's, that's tough to do in, in a labor market where you can't find journey persons but at the lower end of the scale that's where that's where the uh, the, the need can be met and i think with the resource partners go out uh, do the work for them be their hr departments provide the resources so that uh, they'd have to do as little work as possible. They could just pick up the phone and say, I need this type of person and, and you can provide It's tough them. because things are done differently in different countries. Um, I've worked in different countries and felt like the village idiot when I arrived because I didn't know what they call that or what that is because practices are different. But it doesn't take uh, a four-year program to get somebody up to speed. The fundamental skill sets, especially from people who have been practitioners in other countries, are there. They know what to do, they know how to do it, they just don't know what you're using around here. The Skills for Change program complements to the way it's laid out. We throw a lot of the, here's what we do in Canada, that's terminology, familiarity with practices to get people up to speed quickly. In terms of a long-term solution, and how do you integrate that person into the job market now? How do you convince employers? I think that goes back to your question earlier. It's tough. Like we've got organized labor people here that can make stuff happen. They know where the jobs are. But you mentioned, Colin, like the little companies aren't in the HR business. I used to have a little company. I put an ad in the paper once. I couldn't make a phone call for two weeks. It kept ringing. I was bombarded. But I don't have an HR department. So from the, the employment brokers that are here, or the placement people, networking with those little companies that don't have an HR department, so they can call you and say, listen, I got a big job, I need to push, I need three, four guys, can you put me together with little labor brokers? Us, um, and as a union uh, representative, I'm in the business of educating employers um, about the, the ways they can uh, utilize uh, our members uh, better. It's, it's the education of employers. Employers are not in the business, especially in the construction uh, industry, are not in the business to, uh, to, uh, to look for people. They want people uh, when they want them. Uh, they want them tomorrow or today or yesterday. And they're, 
a lot of the smaller companies, they don't have human resource departments. They don't have the skill sets to, uh, to know where to go and go or to look for uh, to labor. So um, for us, it's education. It's here's a, a pool of labor. Here are people that are ready to go. And you just got to trust us and you got to make sure and we got to make sure that they're ready with respect to health and safety training and all the skill sets that, that they need. Um, I've worked in different countries and felt like the village idiot when I arrived because I didn't know what they call that or what that is because practices are different. But it doesn't take uh, a four year program to get somebody up to speed. The fundamental skill sets, especially from people who have been practitioners in other countries, are there. They know what to do, they know how to do it, they just don't know what you're using around here. The Skills for Change program complements to the way it's laid out. We throw a lot of the, here's what we do in Canada, that's terminology, familiarity with practices to get people up to speak. Come up, the, the average apprentice in Ontario is 28 years old. It's still very high. Um, you would think that that would be much closer to graduating from high school. Uh, you think that number would be 23, 22, somewhere in that range, right? Uh, but but those individual are, individuals are being encouraged to go to college and university, not find employment, and then and then come back with this debt load uh, and trying to find uh, a, a good job. Right, and, and they find their way into trades as a second option, not their first option. So it's so important that we, 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 we promote the skilled trades careers at a young age.